Hello and welcome to this Beyond Shakespeare exploring session, except it's less of an exploring session, more a, a read through with occasional chattage. Uh, I'm your host, Robert Crichton, and welcome to the tragedy of Dido, Queen of Carthage by Christopher Marlowe, and uh, possibly in conjunction with Nash. Um, and it was uh, written and performed uh, somewhere in the 1580s. 80s. I'm not going to uh, worry too much about precision on this point because opinions do seem to vary and I'm not going to get into an argument over such things. Uh, it is I say, uh, designed to be performed uh, by a boys company uh, but we have however a range of adults for you here all, all uh, with uh, responsible and sensible people who will uh, uh, introduce themselves as I go through my, my, my little script so playing jupiter and uh, a name we hadn't actually decided how to pronounce before we started uh, cloanthus i'm gonna go for uh if this is uh, invisible Hayes in the cave how are you all lovely to see you or not <laughs> lovely <laughs> and playing uh, ganymede and ilionus 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 yeah, Ilionius, I think we're going to go with. Um, hello, I'm Eloise. Um, yeah. And uh, playing uh, at the moment, uh, it's looking like playing Anna. It's going to be... Hi, my name's Sasha Cooper and I'm an actress based in Brighton in the UK. And uh, uh, playing uh, Katie's is... Um, Steve Longstaff. Um, I'm a scholar of early modern drama. And uh, playing the titular figure of the drama Dido is currently muted, <laughs> but unmuted. Hello, Emily, <laughs> uh, actor, uh, scholar of early modern theater and what you will. And uh, playing uh, uh, Ascanius and the nurse is. Hi, I'm Liza Graham. It's uh, very lovely to meet you. <laughs> Lovely indeed. And then we have uh, Sir Gestus and Cupid uh, as played by... Hello, I'm Joseph. Uh, I'm an MA uh, creative writing student and actor in Oxford. And playing Juno and First Lord, a part that she was born to play. Hello, I'm Sarah Blake. Uh, I'm an actor, writer and director. Hi. And playing, we decided in advance, we're going for Aeneas. Uh, so hold on to your knees, everybody. Uh, playing Aeneas, Aeneas is... Uh, I'm Alex Scott Fairley, and I'm an actor from the Highlands of Scotland. And did I miss anybody out? No. And so I'm Robert Crichton, and I am probably playing Yabus, um, and I'm reading the stage directions and occasionally producing sound effects as and when it amuses me. Um, otherwise, we're going to crack on with the first two acts of the tragedy of Dido. So, act one, scene one. Here, the curtains are drawn. There is discovered Jupiter, dandling Ganymede upon his knees, and variously named Hermes or Mercury to taste, lying asleep. Come, gentle Ganymede, and play with me. I love thee well, say Juno what she will. I am much better for your worthless love. That will not shield me from her shrewish blows. Today, when as I filled into your cups and held the cloth of pleasance whilst you drank, she reached me such a rap for that I spilled as made the blood run down about mine ears. What? Dare she strike the darling of my thought, or oh, by Saturn's soul and this earth threatening hair that shake and thrice makes nature's buildings quake, I vow if she but once frown on thee more to hang her, meteor like, twixt heaven and earth, and bind her hand and foot with golden cords, as once I did for harming Hercules. Might I but see that pretty sport afoot? Oh, how would I with Helen's brother laugh and bring the gods to wonder at the game? Sweet Jupiter, if e'er I pleased thine eye or seemed fair, walled in with eagle's wings, grace my immortal beauty with this boon. 
and I will spend my time in thy bright arms. What is sweet wag? I should deny thy youth, whose face reflects such pleasure to mine eyes, as I, exhaled with thy fire-darting beams, have oft driven back the horses of the night, when as they would have hauled thee from my sight. Sit on my knee and call for thy content. Control proud fate and cut the thread of time. Why are not all the gods at thy command, and heaven and earth the bounds of thy delight? Vulcan shall dance to make thee laugh in sport, and my nine daughters sing when thou art sad. From Juno's bird I'll pluck her spotted pride to make thee fans wherewith to cool thy face, and Venus swans shall shed their silver down to sweeten out the slumbers of thy bed. Hermes no more shall show the world his wings, if that they fancy in his feathers dwell. But, as this one, I'll tear them all from him. Do thou but Pluck say... the <laughs> feather from Hermes' wings. But as this one, I'll tear them all from him. Do thou but say, their colour pleases. Hold here, my little love, these linked gems. My Give Juno some jewels. My Juno wear upon the marriage day. Put thou about thy neck, mine own sweetheart, and trick thy arms and shoulders with my best. I would have a jewel for mine ear, and a fine brooch to put into my hat, and then I'll hug you with a hundred times. And shall have, Ganymede, if thou wilt be my love. Enter Venus. Which is unfortunate because I don't think I actually reallocated Venus, did I? Ah, uh, no. Okay, Sasha, you're also Venus. I apologize. <laughs> no we, worries. We had a last minute substitution, so... <laughs> Dasha, you're up as enter Venus. Venus, okay, lovely. Aye, this is it. You can sit toying there and playing with that female wanton boy, whilst my Aeneas wanders on the seas and rests a prey to every billow's pride. Juno, false Juno, in her chariot's pomp, drawn through the heavens by steeds of boreous brood, made Hebe to direct her airy wheels into the windy country of the clouds, where, finding Aeolus entrenched with storms and guarded with a thousand grisly ghouls, she humbly did beseech him for our bane, and charged him drown my son with all his train. Then gan the winds break ope their brazen doors, and awe Aeola to be up in arms, Poor Troy must now be sacked upon the sea, and Neptune's waves be envious men of war. If Theseus's horse to Edna's hill transformed, prepared stands to wreck their wooden walls, and Aeolus, like Agamemnon, sounds the surges, his fierce soldiers to the spoil. See how the night Ulysses like comes forth and intercepts the day as Dolon erst. Ay me, the stars surprised, like Rhesus' steeds, are drawn by darkness forth Astraeus' tents. What shall I do to save thee, my sweet boy, when they as the waves do threat our crystal world, and Proteus, raising hills of floods on high, intends ere long to sport him in the sky? False Jupiter, rewards thou virtue so? What, is not piety exempt from woe? Then die, Aeneas, in thine innocence, since that religion hath no recompense. Content thee, Cytheria, in thy care, since thy Aeneas' wandering fate is firm, whose weary limbs shall shortly make repose, in those fair walls I promised him of yore, but first in blood must his good fortune bud. 
before he be the lord of Turner's town, or force her smile that hitherto hath frowned. Three winters shall he with the Rutiles war, and in the end subdue them with his sword. And full three summers likewise shall he waste in managing those fierce barbarian minds, which once performed poor Troy so long suppressed. From forth her ashes shall advance her head, and flourish once again that erst was dead. But bright Ascanius, beauty's better work, who with the sun divided one radiant shape, shall build his throne am amidst those starry towers that earthborn Atlas groaned and cross. No bounds, but heaven shall bound his empire whose azure gates encased with his name shall make the morning haste her grey uprise to feed her eyes with his engraven fame. Thus stout in, thus in stout Hector's race, three hundred years the Roman sceptre royal shall remain, till that a princess priest conceived by Mars shall yield to dignity a double birth, who will it tarries Troy in their attempts. How may I hear these by flattering tones, when yet both sea and stands beset their ships? And Phoebus, as in Stygian pools, refrains to taint his tresses in the Tyran main. I will take order for that presently. Herbie's awake, and haste to Neptune's, Neptune's realm, where as the wind god Warring now with fate, besieges the offspring of our kindly loins. Charge him from me to turn his stormy powers, and fetter them in Vulcan's sturdy brass, that durst thus proudly wrong our kinsmen peace. Exit Hermes. Venus, farewell. Thy son shall be our care. Come, Ganymede. We must about this gear. Exit Jupiter and Ganymede. Disquiet seas, lay down your swelling looks and court Aeneas with your calmy cheer, whose beauteous burden Mel might make you proud, had not the heavens conceived with hell-born clouds veiled his resplendent glory from your view. For my sake, Pity him, O Shanus, that erstwhile issued from thy watery loins, and had my being from thy bubbly throth. Triton, I know, hath filled his trump with Troy, and therefore will take pity on his toil, and call both Thetis and Simotho to succour him in this extremity. Enter Aeneas, Ascanius, a Cates and others. What do I see? My son now come on shore? Venus, how art thou compassed with content, the while thine eyes attract their sought for joys? Great Jupiter, still honoured mayest thou be for this so friendly aid in time of need. Here in this bush, disguised will I stand, whilst my Aeneas spends himself in plants and plaints, and heaven and earth with his unrest acquaints. You sons of care, companions of my course, Priam's misfortune follows us by sea, and Helen's rape doth haunt us at our heels. How many dangers have we overpassed? Both barking Scylla and the sounding rocks, the cyclops shells and grim Coronia's seat have you o'ergone and yet remain alive. Pluck up your hearts since fate still rests our friend, and changing heavens may those good days return, which Pergama did vaunt in all her pride. Brave Prince of Troy, thou only art our god that by thy virtues freest us from annoy, and makest our hopes survive to coming joys. Do thou but smile, and cloudy heaven will clear, whose night and day descendeth from thy brows. Though we be now in extreme misery, and rest the map of weather beaten woe, yet shall the aged son shed forth his hair to make us live unto our former heat, and every beast the forest doth send forth, bequeath 
her young ones to our scanted food. Father, I faint. Good father, give me meat. Alas, sweet boy, thou must be still a while till we have fire to dress the meat we killed. Gentle Achates, reach the tinder box that we may make a fire to warm us with and roast our new found victuals on this shore. See what strange arts necessity finds out. How near, my sweet Aeneas, art thou driven? Hold, take this candle and go light a fire. You shall have leaves and windfall boughs enough, near to these woods, to roast your meat withal. Ascanius, go and dry these drenched limbs, whilst I with my Achates rove abroad, to know what coast the wind hath driven us on, or whether men or beasts inhabit it. Exuant Ascanius and others. The air is pleasant and the soil most fit for cities and society supports. Yet much I marvel that I cannot find no steps of men imprinted in the earth. Now is the time for me to play my part. Ho, oh, young men, saw you as you came. Any all of all my sisters wandering here? Having a quiver girded to her side and clothed in a spotted leopard skin? I neither saw nor heard of any such. But what may I, fair virgin, call your name, whose looks set forth no mortal form to view, nor speech bewrays aught human in thy birth? Thou art a goddess that deludest our eyes, and shrouds thy beauty in this borrowed shape. But whether thou the sun's bright sister be, or one of chaste Diana's fellow nymphs, live happy in the height of all content, and lighten our extremes with this one boon, as to instruct us under what good heaven we breathe as now, and what this world is called, on which by tempest's fury we are cast. Tell us, oh tell us that are ignorant, and this right hand shall make thy altars crack with mountain heaps of milk-white sacrifice. Such honour, stranger, do I not affect. It is the use for Tyrian maids to wear, their bow and quiver in this modest sort, and suit themselves in purple for the nonce, that they may trip more lightly over the lawns, and overtake the tusked ball in my chaste. But for the land whereof thou dost inquire, it is the Punic kingdom, rich and strong, a journey on Egno's stately town, the kingly seat of southern Libya, whereas Sidonian Dido rules as queen. But what are you that ask me these things? Whence may you come, or whither will you go? Of Troy am I, Aeneas is my name, who, driven by war from forth my native world, put sails to sea to seek out Italy, and my divine descent from sceptred Jove. With twice twelve Phrygian ships I ploughed the deep, and made that way my mother Venus led. But of them all scarce seven do anchor safe, and they so wrecked and weltered by the waves as every tide tilts twixt their oaken sides, and all of them, unburdened of their load, are ballast with billows watery weight. But hapless I, God what, poor and unknown, do trace these Libyan deserts, all despised, exiled forth Europe and wide Asia both, and have not any coverture but heaven. Fortune hath favoured thee, whate'er thou be, in sending thee unto this courteous coast. A God's name on, and haste thee to the court, where Dido will receive you with her smiles. And for thy ships, which thou supposed lost, not one of them hath perished in the storm, but are arrived safe, not far from hence. And so I leave thee to thy fortune's lot, wishing good luck unto thy wandering steps. Exit Venus. Achates, tis my mother that is fled. I know her by the movings of her feet. Stay, gentle Venus, fly not from thy son. Too cruel. Why wilt thou forsake me thus, or in these shades deceivest mine eyes so oft? Why talk we not together, hand in hand, and tell our griefs in more familiar terms? But thou art gone, and leavest me here alone, to dull the air with my discoursive moan. Exuant Aeneas, and we move into this next scene. Enter Iabus, followed by Ilioneus, uh, Cloanthus, uh, Sir Jesthus and others. Follow, ye Trojans, follow this brave lord, and plain to him the sum of your distress. Why, what are you, or wherefore do you sue? Wretches of Troy, 
envied of the winds that grave such favour at your honour's feet as poor distressed misery may plead. Save, save, oh, save our ships from cruel fire that do complain the wounds of thousands' waves and spare our lives, whom every spite pursues. We come not, we, to wrong your Libyan gods or steal your household lairs from their shrines. Our hands are not prepared to lawless spoil nor armed to offend in any kind. Such force is far from our unweaponed thoughts, whose fading wheel of victory forsook forbids all hope to harbour near our hearts. But tell me, Trojans, Trojans if you be, unto what fruitful quarters were ye bound before that Boreas buckled with your sails? There is a place, Hesperia termed by us, an ancient empire, famous said for arms and fertile in fair series furrowed wealth which now we call italia of his name that in such place long time did rule the same thither made we when suddenly gloomy orion rose and led our ships into the shallow sand whereas the southern wind with brackish breath dispersed them all amongst the wreckful rocks from thence a few of us escaped to land. The rest, we fear, are folded in the floods. Brave men at arms, <laughs> abandon fruitless fears, since Carthage knows to entertain distress. Aye, but the barbarous thought do fret our ships, and will not let us lodge upon the sands. In multitudes they swarm unto the shore, and from first, the first earth interdict our feet. Myself will see they shall not trouble ye. Your men and you shall banquet in our court, and every Trojan be as welcome here as Jupiter to silly Borcus' house. Come in with me, I'll bring you to my queen, who shall confirm my words with further deeds. Thanks, gentle lord, for such unlooked-for grace. Might we but once see Aeneas' face, then we would hope uh, then would we hope to quite such friendly turns as shall surpass the wonder of our speech. Exuant all, and we move into the next act, act two, scene one, enter Aeneas, Achates, Ascanius, and others. Where am I now? These should be Carthage walls. Why stands my sweet Aeneas thus amazed? Oh, my Achates! Theban Niobe, who for her son's death wept out life and breath, and dry with grief was turned into a stone, had not such passions in her head as I. Methinks that town there should be Troy, yon Ida's hill, there Xanthus' stream, because he is Priamus, and when I know it is not, then I die. And in this humour is Achates too. I cannot choose but fall upon my knees and kiss his hand. Where is Hecuba? Here she was wont to sit, but saving air is nothing here. What is this but stone? Oh, yet this stone doth make Aeneas weep, and would my prayers, as Pygmalions did, could give it life, that under his conduct we might sail back to Troy and be revenged on these hard-hearted Grecians, which rejoice that nothing now is left of Priamus. Oh, Priamus is left, and this is he. Come. Come aboard, pursue the hateful Greeks. What means Aeneas? Achates, though mine eyes say this is stone, yet thinks my mind that this is Priamus, and when my grieved heart sighs and says no, then would it leap out to give Priam life? Oh, were I not at all, so thou mightst be. Achates, see, King Priam wags his hand. He is alive. Troy is not overcome. Thy mind, Aeneas that would have it so deludes thy eyesight. Primus is dead. Ah, Troy is sacked, and Primus is dead. And why should poor Aeneas be alive? Sweet father, leave to weep. This is not he. For were it Priam, he would smile on me. Aeneas, see, here come the citizens. Leave to lament, lest they laugh at our fears. Enter Clo uh, Anthus, Sir Gestus, uh, and Ilionius, and others. Lords of this town, or whatsoever style belongs unto your name, vouchsafe of Ruth to tell us who inhabits this fair town, 
what kind of people and who governs them? For we are strangers driven on this shore and scarcely know within what clime we are. I hear Aeneas' voice, but see him not, for none of these can be our general. Achilleonius speaks this nobleman. Leonius goes not in such robes. You are Achates, or I am deceived. Yes, see, Sir Justus, or, or his ghost. He names Aeneas. Let us kiss his feet. It is our captain, see, Ascanius. Long live Aeneas and Ascanius. Achates, speak, for I am overjoyed. Oh, Leonius, art thou yet alive? Bless be the time I see Achates' face. Why turns Aeneas from his trusty friends? Suggestus, Ileneus, and the rest, your sight amazed me. Oh, oh, what destinies have brought my sweet companions in such plight? Oh, tell me, for I long to be resolved. Lovely Aeneas, these are Carthage walls, and here Queen Dido wears the imperial crown, who for Troy's sake hath entertained us all, and clad us in these wealthy robes we wear. Oft hath she asked us under whom we served, and when we told her, she would weep for grief, thinking the sea had swallowed up thy ships. And now she sees thee, how she will rejoice. See where her servitors pass through the hall bearing a banquet. Dido is not far. Look where she comes, Aeneas, view her well. Well may I view her, but she sees not me. Enter Dido, Anna, Iabus, and Train. What stranger art thou that dost eye me thus? Sometime I was a Trojan, mighty queen, but Troy is not. What shall I say I am? Renowned Dido, tis our general, warlike Aeneas. Warlike Aeneas, and in these base robes. Go fetch the comment which Sicaius wore. Exit an attendant who brings in the garment which Aeneas puts on. Brave prince, welcome to Carthage and to me, both happy that Aeneas is our guest. Sit in this chair and banquet with the queen. Aeneas is Aeneas, or he clad in weeds as bad as ever Iris wear. This is no seat for one that's comfortless. May it please your grace to let Aeneas wait. For though my birth be great, my fortune's mean, too mean to be companion to a queen. Thy fortune may be greater than thy birth. Sit down, Aeneas, sit in Dido's place. And if this be thy son, as I suppose, here, let him sit. Be merry, lovely child. This place beseems me not. Oh, pardon me. I'll have it so, Aeneas, be content. Madam, you shall be my mother. And so I will, sweet child. Be merry, men. Here's to thy better fortune and good stars. Drinks. In all humility, I thank your grace. Remember who thou art. Speak like thyself. Humility belongs to common grooms. And who so miserable as Aeneas is? Lies it in Dido's hands to make thee blessed? Then be assured thou art not miserable. O oh, Primus, O oh, Troy, O oh, Hecuba. May I entreat thee to discourse at large, and truly too, how Troy was overcome? For many tales go of that city's fall, and scarcely do agree upon one point. Some say Antior did betray the town, others report was Sinon's perjury. But all in this, that Troy is overcome, and Priam dead, yet how we hear no news. A woeful tale bids Dido to unfold whose memory like pale death's stony mace beats forth my senses from this troubled soul and makes Aeneas sink at Dido's feet. What faints Aeneas to remember Troy, in whose defence he fought so valiantly? Look up and speak. Then speak, Aeneas, with Achilles' tongue. And Dido and you Carthaginian peers, hear me, but yet with Myrmidon's harsh ears, daily inured to broils and massacres, lest you be moved too much with my sad tale. The Grecian soldiers, tired with ten years' war, began to cry, Let us unto our ships. Troy is invincible. Why stay we here? With whose outcries Atreides, being appalled, summoned the captains to his princely tent, who, looking on the scars we Trojans gave, seeing the number of their men decreased and the remainder weak and out of heart, gave up their voices to dislodge the camp, and so in troops all marched to Tenedos, where when they came, 
Ulysses on the sand essayed with honey words to turn them back. And as he spoke, to further his intent, the winds did drive huge billows to the shore, and heaven was darkened with tempestuous clouds. Then he alleged the gods would have them stay, and prophesied Troy should be overcome. And therewithal he called false Sinon forth, a man compact of craft and perjury, whose ticing tongue was made of Hermes pipe, to force an hundred watchful eyes to sleep. And him, Apeus, having made the horse, with sacrificing wreaths upon his head, Ulysses sent to our unhappy town, who, grovelling in the mire of Xanthus' banks, his hands bound at his back and both his eyes turned up to heaven as one result to die, our Phrygian shepherds hailed within the gates and brought unto the court of Priamus, to whom he used actions so pitiful, looks so remorseful, vows so forcible, as therewithal the old man overcome, kissed him, embraced him, and unloosed his bands, and then... Oh, Dido, pardon me. Nay, leave not here. Resolve me of the rest. Oh, the enchanting words of that base slave made him to think Apeus' pine tree horse a sacrifice to appease Minerva's wrath. The rather, for that one Laocoon, breaking a spear upon his hollow breast, was with two winged serpents stung to death. Whereat aghast, we were commanded straight with reverence to draw it into Troy in which unhappy work was I employed. These hands did help to hail it to the gates, through which it could not enter, t'was so huge. Oh, had it never entered, Troy had stood. But Priamus, impatient of delay, enforced a wide breach in that rampired wall, which thousand battering rams could never pierce. And so came in this fatal instrument, at whose accursed feet, as overjoyed, we banqueted, till overcome with wine. Some surfeited and others soundly slept, which Sinon viewing caused the Greekish spies to haste to Tenedos and tell the camp. Then he unlocked the horse, and suddenly, from out his entrails, Neoptolemus, setting his spear upon the ground, leapt forth, and after him a thousand Grecians more, in whose stern faces shined the quenchless fire that after burnt the pride of Asia. By this, the camp was come unto the walls and through the breach did march into the streets where, meeting with the rest, kill, kill, they cried. Frighted with this confused noise, I rose, and looking from a turret, might behold young infants swimming in their parents' blood, headless carcasses piled up in heaps, virgins half dead, dragged by their golden hair, and with main force flung on a ring of pikes, old men with swords thrust through their aged sides, kneeling for mercy to a Greekish lad, who with steel pole axes dashed out their brains. Then buckled I mine armor, drew my sword, and thinking to go down, came Hector's ghost with ashy visage, bluish sulphur eyes, his arms torn from his shoulders and his breast furrowed with wounds, and that which made me weep thongs at his heels, by which Achilles' horse drew him in triumph through the Greekish camp, burst from the earth, crying, Aeneas, fly, Troy is afire, the Grecians have the town. O oh, Hector, who weeps not to hear thy name? Yet flung I forth, and desperate of my life, ran in the thickest throngs, and with this sword sent many of their savage ghosts to hell. At last came Pyrrhus, fell and full of ire, his harness dropping blood, and on his spear the mangled head of Priam's youngest son. And after him, his band of myrmidons, with balls of wildfire in their murdering paws, which made the funeral flame that burnt fair Troy, all which hemmed me about, crying, This is he! Oh, how could poor Aeneas escape their hands? My mother Venus, jealous of my health, conveyed me from their crooked nets and bands. So I escaped the furious Pyrrhus wrath, who then ran to the palace of the king, and at Joe's altar, finding Priamus, about whose withered neck hung Hecuba, folding his hand in hers and jointly both beating their breasts and falling on the ground, he, with his falchion's point raised up at once, and with Megara's eyes stared in their face, threatening a thousand deaths at every glance, to whom the aged king thus trembling spoke. Achilles' son, remember what I was, father of fifty sons, but they are slain, lord of my fortune, but my fortune's turned, king of this city, but my Troy is fired, and now am neither father, lord, or king. Yet who so wretched but desires to live, 
Oh, let me live, great Neoptolemus. Not moved at all, but smiling at his tears, this butcher, whilst his hands were yet held up, treading upon his breast, struck off his hands. Oh, and Aeneas, I can hear no more. At which the frantic queen leaped on his face, and in his eyelid, hanging by the nails, a little while prolonged her husband's life. At last, the soldiers pulled her by the heels and swung her howling in the empty air, which sent an echo to the wounded king, whereat he lifted up his bed-rid limbs and would have grappled with Achilles' son, forgetting both his want of strength and hands, which he, disdaining, whisked his sword about, and with the wind thereof the king fell down. Then from the navel to the throat at once he ripped old Priam, at whose latter gasp Job's marble statue gan to bend the brow, as loathing Pyrrhus for this wicked act. Yet he, undaunted, took his father's flag and dipped it in the old king's chill cold blood, and then in triumph ran into the streets, through which he could not pass for slaughtered men. So leaning on his sword, he stood stone still, viewing the fire where it with rich Ilium burnt. By this, I got my father on my back, this young boy in mine arms, and by the hand led fair Creusa, my beloved wife, when thou, Achates, with thy sword madest way, and we were round environed with the Greeks. Oh, there I lost my wife, and had not we fought manfully, I had not told this tale. Yet manhood would not serve. Of force we fled, and as we went unto our ships, thou knowest we saw Cassandra sprawling in the streets, whom Ajax ravished in Diana's fame, her cheeks swollen with sighs, her hair all rent, whom I took up to bear unto our ships. But suddenly the Grecians followed us, and I, alas, was forced to let her lie. Then got we to our ships, and being aboard, Polyxena cried out, Aeneas, stay, the Greeks pursue me, stay, and take me in. Moved with her voice, I leaped into the sea, thinking to bear her on my back aboard, for all our ships were launched into the deep, and... As I swum, she standing on the shore was by the cruel Myrmidons surprised, and after that, by Pyrrhus sacrificed. I die with melting Ruth, Aeneas leave. Oh, what became of aged Hecuba? How got Aeneas to the fleet again? But how escaped Talon, she that caused the war? Achates, speak. Sorrow hath tired me quite. What happened to the Queen we cannot show. We hear they led her captive into Greece. As for Aeneas, he swam quickly back, and Helena betrayed Deiphobus, her lover, after Alexander died, and so was reconciled to Menelaus. Oh, had that ticing strumpet ne'er been born. Trojan, thy ruthful tale hath made me sad. Come, let us think upon some pleasing sport to rid me from these melancholy thoughts. Exuant all except Ascanius, whom Venus, entering with Cupid at another door, takes by the sleeve as he is going off. Fair child, stay thou with Dido's waiting maid. I'll give thee sugar almonds, sweet conserves, a silver girdle, and a golden purse, and this young prince shall be thy playfellow. Are you Queen Dido's son? Aye, and my mother gave me this fine bow. Shall I have such a quiver and such a bow? <laughs> such bow, such quiver, and such golden shafts will Dido give to sweet Asanius. For Dido's sake, I take thee in my arms mm. and stick these spangled feathers in thy hat. Eat comforts in mine arms, and I will sing. And she does indeed sing, but what it is she sings is not in the text here. Continue. Now he is fast asleep, and in his grove, amongst green brakes, I'll lay Asanius and strew him with sweet-smelling violets, blushing roses, purple hyacinth. These milk-white doves shall be his centronels, who, if that any seek to do him harm, will quickly fly to Cytheria's flist. Now, Cupid, turn thee to Asanius' shape, and go to Dido, who, instead of him, will set thee on her lap, and play with thee. 
then touch her white breast with this arrowhead, that she may dote upon Aeneas' love, and by that means repair his broken ships, victual his soldiers, give him wealthy gifts, and he at last depart to Italy, or else in Carthage make his kingly throne. I will, fair mother, and so play my part, as every touch will wound Queen Dido's heart. Exit Cupid. Sleep, my sweet nephew, in these cooling shades, free from the murmur of these running streams, the cry of beasts, the rattling of the winds, or whisking of these leaves, all shall be still, and nothing interrupt thy quiet sleep till I return and take thee hence again. And exit. Okay, we're at the end of the second act. Um, there's a huge amount of stuff to talk about here. The the slightly traumatised state of Aeneas uh, there. Uh, there's almost a discussion of PTSD sy uh, symptoms there as he, 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 he hallucinates for a moment that he's back in Troy. Um, and uh, I, I wonder if that's, that's a place to talk about brief, uh, start the discussion. I've got many points to say, but uh, any thoughts about, uh, shall we start with Aeneas and his band, as it were? Oh, silence. Would you be as they are um, going to found a new kingdom because they're refugees in that sort of vein? Is that what you mean? Well, yeah, I mean, just just the state of them when they arrive. I mean, they're all they're all slightly uh, bedraggled. They're they're all separated. They, they, yeah. There is a merry meeting um, that 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 joins some of them uh, back together again. Um, and uh, and and just that their their state of mind when they're, they they arrive. Well, they're they're starving, right? Mm. They're entirely dependent on the charity of whomever they run into. Yeah, absolutely. As we can see in recent history of our own time now, mm. yeah, I mean, it's quite um, apt the, for this play to be done at this time. You know, well, notwithstanding uh, the coronavirus as we are, but we've seen many, many, many refugees trying to make their way in the world after being, you know, dislocated from wherever they've been because of war. Yes. Mm. Mm. And, and we've got, uh, we've got uh, the in co confusion because the gods are interfering um, and, uh, and uh, you know, Venus's plan, it, it, it's a good plan, so you need your boats repaired, so I'll just make, make her fall in love with you. That'll be, that'll be fine. <laughs> That's a plan. That can't go horribly wrong. Of course it um, it's it's overkill by the gods that's setting because actually everything's nice everything's you know the yes they're traumatized it's been a terrible but they're already welcomed they probably yeah. could get most of the help they need anyway um uh, uh, and yet this this over over protectiveness of venus is is going to create all sorts of problems Was that yeah us? uh sorry sarah did Oh, just twas ever thus, you know, like if the gods hadn't interfered in the first place, like <laughs> they'd all be happy in Troy and everything would be ginger peachy. And, yeah. yeah, going yeah, going back of you, you know. Yeah. Isn't that, yeah. you know, it, it's, um, is it not the love of a mother protecting her son as well? Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. It's, that's got to be a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, she's certainly... Yeah. She certainly wants the best for her son. She wants uh, yeah. she wants everything to go according to plan. And I think what Marlowe does really well um, in this play is he pays homage to um, the Greek tragedies and the use of the gods um, in their pieces of work as well. So he's actually brought a lot of history already into it. And he's exploring the what ifs um, of the whole thing of the gods interfering, but in a way it adds that nice dramatic sort of element to it in the sense of he's setting up for a fall, or it could even be a challenge to um, basically see how much strength and love conquers all. And it's interesting, we've got this long bit of story time, which uh, once again, uh, very well done there, uh, sir. Um, but in many ways, you, what you're saying is, is dramatically slightly less important than the effect you're having on Dido. 
um, you know, it, it, there's there's a journey here. You're telling this tale, and Dido is getting um, more and more connected to you. Even before we get to um, any questions of uh, interference of Cupid, there is already a journey here. Uh, I don't know uh, if Emily has uh, any thoughts on that. I mean, I think it's definitely like there is that that <laughs> attraction. I think like in the first line when she says uh, that the, asking. A, uh, a, Aeneas, why he eyes her thus? I think there's something, there's something very palpable there, um, that even that like I think it does start out as like something like like a fondness for like oh I really want to be friends with that, and then develops into something even stronger as we will see later on in the play. Um, but uh, I um, this is completely unrelated. I have a, a text related question. Yeah. Um, if any of you can answer it, um, Venus is Aeneas's mother, but why does she call Aeneas's son her nephew? Ooh, that's mm. not just did that actually. Because um, I was like, that's your grandson, isn't it? Or is <laughs> was there not a proper term for grandson back then? If the anyone knows, Venus is I'm... not Venus is not going to admit to having a grandson. Shouldn't yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. grandmother. <laughs> 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 um, it might just be that nephew's being used in a sort of general way, in the way that cousin mm -hmm. sometimes is. I, I, I don't oh, know, Stephen. Any? Do you have any thoughts on that? No, not without checking it. No, no, no. no. But yeah, I, I think cousin is used all the time, isn't it? Yeah, and it's yeah. and it's a sort of diminutive, affectionate thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, um, it's... Apparently, in Middle English, uh, nephew is it can mean grandson, uh, and and from uh -huh. the old French that it kind of, that it comes from, and then uh, nepotem in in Latin. Apparently, yeah. having just looked for that really quickly. Yeah, uh, and it, it, it is one of those things that also it probably scans better. Um, yeah. okay. So, um, but that was a really good question. Um, I, I'm going to uh, move us swiftly on, I'm afraid, because uh, time is moving uh, apace. Also, we should always remember that it's Thomas Nash as well as the is the author of this. So it's not just Marley. Um, Do we so, know that for oh, sure? Uh, pr pretty much everything I've looked at says so pretty pretty damn certain. Um, so. Um, Though uh, uh, I'm, I'm willing to to have the argument, but um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm always disinclined to overly state any individual person's genius for reasons I'm sure are apparent to everyone. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we will rattle on into Act Three, and Cupid is on the prowl. Enter Cupid, disguised as the as the child Ascanius. Now, Cupid, cause the Carthaginian queen to be enamoured of thy brother's looks. Convey this golden arrow in thy sleeve, lest she imagine thou art Venus's son. And when she strokes thee softly on the head, then shall I touch her breast and conquer her. And at this point, enter Dido, Anna, and myself, Iabas. How long, fair Dido, shall I pine for thee? Tis not enough that thou dost grant me love, but that I may enjoy what i desire but love is childish which consists in words iarbus know that thou of all my wooers and yet have i had many mightier kings has had the greatest favors i could give i fear me dido hath been counted light in being too familiar with iarbus albeit the gods do know no wanton thought had ever residence in dido's breast but Dido is the favour I request. You're not Iarbus. Dido may be thine. Look, Look sister. Oh. How Aeneas's little son plays with your garments and embraces you. No, Dido will not take me in her arms. I shall not be her son. She loves me not. Weep not, sweet boy. Thou shalt be Dido's son. Sit in my lap and let me hear thee sing. And Cupid disguised sings. No more, my child. Now talk another while, and tell me where thou learnst this pretty song. My cousin Helen taught it me in Troy. How lovely is a scantiest when he smiles. Will Dido let me hang about her neck? I wag, and give her, and give thee leave to kiss her too. What will you give me now? I'll have this fan. Take it, Ascantius, for thy father's sake. Come, Dido, live, Ascanius, let us walk. Go thou away, Ascantius shall stay. Uh, ungentle queen, is this thy love to me? Oh, 
stay, Iarbus, and I'll go with thee. And if my mother go, I'll follow her. Why seest thou here? Thou art no love of mine. Iarbus, die seeing she abandons thee. No, live, Iarbus. What hast thou deserved that I should say thou art th no love of mine? Something thou hast deserved. Away, I say, depart from Carthage, come not in my sight. Am I not king of rich Gaetulia? Iarbus, pardon me, and stay a while. Mother, look here. What tellest thou me of rich Gaetul Gaetulia? Gaetulia. <laughs> Am I not queen of Libya? Then depart. I go to feed the humour of my love, yet not from Carthage for a thousand worlds. Iarbus. Doth Dido call me back? No, but I charge thee never look on me. Then pull out both mine eyes or let me die. He exits. <laughs> Wherefore doth Dido bid Iarbus go? Because his loathsome sight offends mine eye, and in my thoughts is shrined another love. Oh, Anna, didst thou know how sweet love were full soon? Thou wouldst, wouldst thou abjure this single life? Poor soul, I know too well the sour of love. Oh, that Iarbus could but fancy me. Is not Aeneas fair and beautiful? Yes, and Iarbus foul and favourless. Is he not eloquent in all his speech? Yes, and Iarbus rude and rustical. Name not Iarbus, but sweet Anna, say, is not Aeneas worthy Dido's love? Oh, sister, were you empress of the world, Aeneas well deserves to be your love. So lovely is he that where'er he goes, the people swarm to gaze him in the face. But tell them none shall gaze on him but I, lest their gross eye beams taint my lover's cheeks. Anna, good sister, Anna, go for him, lest with these sweet thoughts I melt clean away. Then, sister, you'll abjure Iarbus's love? Yet must I hear that loathsome name again? Run for Aeneas, or I'll fly to him. And exit Anna. You shall not hurt my father when he comes. No, for thy sake I'll love thy father well. Oh, dull conceited Dido, that till now didst never think Aeneas beautiful. But now, for quittance of this oversight, I'll make me bracelets of his golden hair. His glistering eyes shall be my looking glass, his lips an altar where I'll offer up as many kisses as the sea hath sands. Instead of music, I will hear him speak. His looks shall be my only library. And thou, Aeneas, Dido's treasury, in whose fair bosom I will lock more wealth than twenty thousand Indias can afford. Oh, here he comes. Love, love, give Dido leave to be more modest than her thoughts admit. Must I be made a wonder to the world? Enter Aeneas, Achates, Gestus, Ilionius, and Cloanthus. Achates, how doth Carthage please your lord? That will Aeneas show your majesty. Aeneas, art thou there? I understand your highness sent for me. No, but now thou art here, tell me, in sooth, in what might Dido highly pleasure thee? So much have I received at Dido's hands, as, without blushing, I can ask no more. Yet, Queen of Africa, are my ships unrigged, my sails all rent in sunder with the wind, my oars broken and my tackling lost, yea, all my navy split with rocks and shelves, nor stern nor anchor have our maimed fleet. Our masts the furious wind struck overboard, which piteous wants if Dido will supply. We will account her author of our lives. Aeneas, I'll repair thy Trojan ships, conditionally that thou wilt stay with me, and let Achates sail to Italy. I'll give thee tackling made of rivelled gold, wound on the barks of odiferous trees, oars of massy ivory, full of holes through which the waters shall delight to play. Thy anchors shall be hewed from crystal rocks, which, if thou lose, shall shine above the waves. The masts, where on thy swelling sail shall hang hollow pyramids of silver plate, the sails of folded lawn, where shall be wrought the wars of Troy, but not Troy's overthrow. 
for ballast. Empty Dido's treasury, take what ye will, but leave Aeneas here. Achates, thou shalt be so seemly clad as seaborn war nymphs shall swarm about thy ships, and wanton mermaids court thee with sweet songs, flinging in favors of more sovereign worth, and Thetis hangs about Apollo's neck, so that Aeneas may but stay with me. Wherefore would Dido have Aeneas stay? To war against my bordering enemies. Aeneas, think not Dido is in love, for if that any... If any man could conquer me, I had been wedded ere Aeneas came. See, where the pictures of my suitors hang? And are not these as fair as fair may be? I saw this man in Troy, ere Troy was sacked. I this in Greece, when Paris stole fair Helen. This man and I were at Olympia's games. I know this face, he is a Persian born. I travelled with him to Aetolia. Cloen and I, uh, yeah, I think that's light, uh, uh, different lines. There. Uh, Cl and I in Athens with this gentleman, unless I be deceived, disputed once. But speak, Aeneas, know you none of these? No, madam, but it seems that these are kings. All these, and others which I never saw, have been most urgent suitors for my love. Some came in person, others sent their legates, yet none obtained me. I am free from all, and yet God knows entangled unto one. This was an orator, and thought by words to compass me, but yet he was deceived. And this, a Spartan courtier, vain and wild, but his fantastic humors pleased not me. This was Alcyon, a musician, but played in air so sweet I let him go. This was the wealthy king of Thessaly. But I had gold enough and cast him off. This, Maligar's son, a warlike prince, but weapons gree not with my tender years. The rest are such as all, as all, as all the world well knows. Yet now I swear by heaven and him I love, I was as far from love as they from hate. Oh, happy shall he be whom Dido loves. Then never say that thou art miserable, because it may be thou shalt be my love. Yet boast not of it, for I love thee not, and yet I hate thee not. Oh, if I speak, I will shall betray myself. Aeneas, come, we two will go a-hunting in the woods, but not so much for thee. Thou art but one, as for uh, Cantes and his followers. Exuant uh, uh, fire um, uh, tinder, by the looks of it there. Um, uh, just to... <laughs> Here's all the people I swiped uh, the other way for. Um, and into the next scene, enter Juno to Ascanius, who still lies asleep. Here lies my hate, Aeneas cursed brat, the boy wherein false destiny delights, the heir of fury, the favourite of the fates, that ugly imp that shall outwear my wrath, and wrong my deity with high disgrace. But I will take another order now, and raise the eternal register of time. Troy shall no more call him her second hope, nor Venus triumph in his tender youth. For here, in spite of heaven, I'll murder him, and feed infection with his let-out life. Say, Paris, now shall Venus have the ball? Say, vengeance, shall now her Ascanius die? Oh, no. God, what, I cannot watch my time, nor quit good turns with double fee down told. Tut, I am simple, without mind to hurt, and have no gall at all to grieve my foes. But lustful Jove and his adulterous child shall find it written on confusion's front that only Juno rules in Ramna's town. Enter Venus. What should this mean? My doves are back returned who warn me of such danger pressed at hand to harm my sweet Ascanthius' lovely life. <sighs> Juno, my mortal foe, what make you here? Avaunt, old witch, and trouble not my wits. Fie, Venus, 
that such causeless words of wrath should e'er defile so fair a mouth as thine. Are we not both sprung of celestial race, and banquet as two sisters with the gods? Why is it then displeasure should disjoin whom kindred and acquaintance co-unites? Out, hateful hag! Thou wouldst have slain my son, had not my doves discovered thy intent. But I will tear thy eyes, throw forth thy head, and feed the birds with their blood-shotten balls, if thou but lay the fingers on my boy. Is this then all the thanks that I shall have for saving him from snakes and serpent stings that would have killed him, sleeping as he lay? What, though I was offended with thy son, and wrought him mickle woe on sea and land, when, for the hate of Trojan Ganymede, that was advanced by me Hebe's shame, and Paris' judgment of the heavenly ball, I mustered all the winds unto his wreck, and urged each element to his annoy. Yet now I do repent me of his ruth, and wish that I had never wronged him so. Bootless I saw it, was to war with fate, that hath so many unresisted friends. Wherefore I changed my counsel with the time, and planted love where envy erst had sprung. Sister of Jove, if that thy love be such as these thy protestations do paint forth, we two, as friends, one fortune will divide. Cupid shall lay his arrows in thy lap, and to a sceptre change his golden shafts. Fancy and modesty shall live as mates, and thy fair peacocks by my pigeons perch. Love, my Aeneas, a desire is thine. The day, the night, my swans, my sweets are thine. More than melodious are these words to me, that overcloy my soul with their content. Venus, sweet Venus, how may I deserve such amorous favours at thy beauteous hand? But that thou mayst more easily perceive how highly I do prize this amity, hark to a motion of eternal league, which I will make in quittance of thy love. Thy son, thou knowest, with Dido now remains, and feeds his eyes with favours of her court. She, likewise, in admiring, spends her time, and cannot talk nor think of aught but him. Why should not they, then, join in marriage, and bring forth mighty kings to Carthage town, whom casualty of sea hath made such friends? And Venus, let there be a match confirmed betwixt these two, whose loves are so alike, and both our deities, conjoined in one, shall chain felicity unto their throne. Well could I like this reconcilement's means, but much I fear my son will ne'er consent, whose armoured soul already on the sea darts forth her light unto Lavinia's shore. Fair queen of love, I will divorce these doubts, and find my way to weary such fond thoughts. This day they both a hunting forth will ride into the woods adjoining to these walls, when in the midst of all their gamesome sports, I'll make the clouds dissolve their watery works and drench Sylvanus dwellings with their showers. Then, in one cave, the queen and he shall meet and interchangeably discourse their thoughts, whose short conclusion will seal up their hearts unto the purpose which we now propound. Sister, I see you savour of my wiles. Be it as you will have it for this once. Meantime, Ascanius shall be my charge, whom I will bear to Ida in mine arms, and couch him in a donous purple down. And exit Venus and Juno. Uh, 
as they're doing their matchmaking thing. Okay, we go into scene three. Enter Dido, Aeneas, Anna, Iarbus, Achates, Cupid, as Ascanius, and followers. Aeneas, think not, but I honor thee that thus in person go with thee to hunt. My princely robes, thou seest, are laid aside, whose glittering pomp Diana's shroud supplies. All fellows now dispose alike to sport. The woods are wide, and we have store of game. Fair Trojan, hold my golden bow a while, until I gird my quiver to my side. Lords, go before. We two must talk alone. Ungentle, can she wrong ye are, but so I'll die before a stranger have that grace. We two will talk alone. What words be these? What makes Iarbus hear of all the rest? We could have gone without your company. But love and duty led him on, perhaps, to press beyond acceptance to your sight. Why, man of Troy, do I offend thine eyes, or art thou grieved thy betters press so nigh? How now, Gaetulian? Are you grown so brave to challenge us with your comparisons? Peasant, go seek companions like thyself, and meddle not with any that I love. Aeneas, be not moved at what he says, for otherwise he will be out of joint. Women may be wrong. Women may wrong by privilege of love, but that, but should that man of men, Dido, except, have taunted me in these opprobrious terms, I would have either drunk his dying blood, or else I would have given my life in gauge. Huntsman, why pitch you not your toils apace, and browse the light-foot deer from forth their lair? Sister, see, see Ascanius in his pomp, bearing his hunt-spear bravely in his hand. Yea, little son, are you so forward now? Ay, mother, I shall one day be a man, and better able unto others' arms. Meantime, these wanton weapons serve my war, which I will break betwixt a lion's jaws. What, darest thou look a lion in the face? Ay, and I'll face him too, do what he can. How oh, like, oh, like his father speaketh he and all. And mort I live to see him sack rich Thebes, and load his spear with Grecian princes' heads, then would I wish me with Anchises' tomb, and dead to honour that hath brought me up. And might I live to see thee shipped away, and hoist aloft on Neptune's hideous hills, then would I wish me in fair Dido's arms, and dead to scorn that hath pursued me so. Stout friend Achates, dost thou know this wood? As I remember, here you shot the deer that sh saved your famished soldiers' lives from death. And first you set your foot upon the shore. And here we met fair Venus, virgin-like, bearing her bow and quiver at her back. Oh, how these irksome labours now delight and overjoy my thoughts with their escape. Who would not undergo all kind of toil to be well stored with such a winter's tale? Aeneas, leave these dumps and let's away you. Some to the mountains, some unto the soil, you to the valleys, thou unto the house. And exuant all except me, Iarbus. Ay, this is it which wounds me to the death to see a Phrygian far fetter the sea preferred before a man of majesty. Oh, love, oh, hate, oh, cruel women's hearts that imitate the moon in every change and like the planets ever love to range. What shall I do? Thus wronged with disdain, revenge me on Aeneas or on her. On her, fond man that were to war against heaven and with one shaft provoke ten thousand darts, this Trojan's end will be thy envy's aim, whose blood will reconcile thee to content and make love drunken with thy sweet desire. But Dido, that now holdeth him so dear, will die with very tidings of his death, but time will discontinue her content and mould her mind into new fancy shapes. O oh God of heaven, turn the hand of fate unto that happy day of my delight. And then, what then? The arbor shall but love. So doth he now, though not with equal gain. That resteth in the rival of thy pain, 
who ne'er will cease to soar till he be slain. And as we move into scene four, a storm. Enter Aeneas and Dido in the cave at several times. Aeneas. Dido. Tell me, dear love, how found you out this cave? By chance, sweet queen, as Mars and Venus met. Why, that was in a net where we are loose, and yet I am not free. Oh, what I were. Why, what is it that Dido may desire and not obtain, be it in human power? The thing that I will die before I ask, and yet desire to have before I die. Is it not aught Aeneas may achieve? Aeneas, no, although his eyes do pierce. What? Hath Iabas angered her in aught, and will she be avenged on his life? Not angered me, except in angering thee. Who then, of all so cruel may he be, that should detain thy eye in his defects? The man that I do eye, where'er I am, whose amorous face like pay and sparkles fire, when as he butts his beams on Flora's bed, Promethe Prometheus has put on Cupid shape, and I must perish in his burning arms. Aeneas, oh, Aeneas, quench these flames. What ails my queen? Is she fallen sick of late? Not sick, my love, but sick I must conceal the torment that it boots me not reveal. And yet I'll speak, and yet I'll hold my peace. Do shame her worse, I will disclose my grief. Aeneas, thou art he. What did I say? S something it was that now I have forgot. <laughs> what means fair Dido by this doubtful speech? Nay, nothing, but Aeneas loves me not. Aeneas' thoughts dare not ascend so high as Dido's heart, which monarchs might not scale. It was because I saw no king like thee, whose golden crown might balance my content. But now that I have found what to effect, I follow one that loveth fame for me, and rather had seen fair in Siren's eyes than to the Carthage queen that dies for him. If that your majesty can look so low as my despised worth that shun all praise, with this, my hand, I give to you my heart, and vow by all the gods of hospitality, by heaven and earth and my fair brother's bow, by Paphos, Capis, and the purple sea from whence my radiant mother did ascend, and by this sword that saved me from the Greeks never to leave these new uprearied walls, whilst Dido lives and rules in Juno's town, Never to like or love any but her. What more than Delian music do I hear that calls my soul from forth his living seat to move unto the measures of delight? Kind clouds that sent forth such a courteous storm as may disdain to fly from fa to fla fancy's lap. Stout love, in mine arms make thy Italy, whose crown and kingdom rests at thy command. Sicaeus, not Aeneas, be thou called, the king of Carthage, not Achaeus' son. Hold, take these jewels at thy lover's hand. Giving jewels, etc. These golden bracelets, and this wedding ring, wherewith my husband wooed me yet a maid, and be thou king of Libya by my gift. Exuant to the cave. Q. Barry White. <laughs> um, uh, we will just briefly pause <laughs> there. Um, I think, is it Anchises' son? Uh, just that, uh, that uh, queried um, pronunciation. Uh, is that something I've made up or not? Um, yes, it, it is. Yes. Okay. Um, my I mean, it is Anchises. You didn't yeah, make it up. Yes. Um, uh, the, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, policing uh, pronunciation because I, having agreed pronunciations at the top, I'm, ra I'm driving through them with a, 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 a freight train. Um, <laughs> I'm really playing a nasty stalker figure here, aren't I? Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, not having read ahead for my part, I was sort of going, oh, there, he's, he's there, he's, he's a thing. Um, oh, God, no, he's, he's, a, he's toxic. Um, how's Aeneas, how, uh, uh, Aeneas, how, how are you feeling um, yourself? I mean, how, we know, we really do know what Dido's feeling, but how much do we know what Aeneas is feeling? He comes across as slightly clueless, doesn't he? I mean, I know the Victorians loved him because he was dreadfully pious, but he sort of comes across as not a good reader of, 
of what's quite plainly in front of him. And he sort of reminds me a bit, it's been a while since I read it, but um, Hero and Leander, where sort of Neptune puts the moves on uh, Leander, and Leander is sort of blindly unaware of what's actually going on until, until Neptune really makes a pass at him. Um, yeah. And I wonder if that's sort of part of his... I mean, I love Marlowe because I think he has such a light touch with all of this. I mean, for, for something that is packed full of, of classical reference and, and you know, well-drawn, well-fleshed-out characters, that, that there's a lightness of touch about it, that there's... It, it is humorous. I mean, despite the fact we know it's going to end how it is going to end. Um, well, you say that some people in the room may not. <laughs> sorry, I haven't read it. Um, <laughs> I, um, that, that, that's, I mean, it's also that thing you mentioned in passing that you, you your wife's um, you've lost your wife. Um, oh yes, something yes, in your big opening well, spe- your big speech. In love with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a sort of ding dong moment I felt in Dido's head at that moment of going, ah, he's single. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm sorry for your loss, but ah, there's no <laughs> wedding ring. Mm. Mm. And just the way that Cupid, as the child, um, it's so, it's sort of sweet, but it's so creepy at the same mm-hmm. time. Um, is there a moment when um, Cupid actually uses his dart, or is this all actually just a, a bit of a lie, and this was all going to happen we, anyway? That's, that's a question I, wonder, I wondered. He sings at one point. There's no he, stage direction saying he, 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 he dabs her. There's, there's no stage direction, but you can see, we'll see this the next time Cupid uses his dart as well. We see Dido going back and forth with Iarbus, saying, you know, oh, stay, Iarbus. No, no, go, get thee gone. No, stay here. No, sod off, I don't love you. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure Cupid gets in several hits. Uh, mm. It sort of felt like it was sort of business that almost there's a kind of like, oh, I've almost got her, uh, I've missed kind of that, like almost that comedic about that scene because she's vacillating so much between the two. Mm I'd, I'd love to discuss that? further, but I, I'm going to I'm going to keep us ploughing forward because uh, there's still a, a reasonable chunk yet to go. So uh, mm-hmm. I've, uh, hold your thoughts, make a note, and uh, we'll try to get to them. And obviously, time your uh, comfort breaks if you need them by switching off your 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 feed um, and uh, uh, to mute and nipping away if you have the moment. Uh, otherwise, we will crack on with Act Four, Scene One. Enter Achates, Cupid as Ascenius, uh, Iarbus, and Anna. Did ever men see such a sudden storm, or day so clear, so suddenly or cast? I think some fell enchantress dwelleth here that can call them forth, when as she please and dive into black tempest treasury, when as she means to mask the world with clouds. In all my life, I never knew the like. It hailed, it snowed, it lightened all at once. I think it was the devil's revelling night, with such a hurly-burly in the heavens. Doubtless Apollo's axle tree is cracked, or aged Atlas' shoulder out of joint. The motion was so over-violent. In all this coil, where have ye left the queen? Nay, where's my warlike father? Can you tell? Behold where both of them come forth the cave. Come forth the cave. Can heaven endure this sight? Yarbus curse that unrevenging Jove, whose flinty darts slept in Typhonius' den, whilst these adulterers surfeited with sin. Nature, why mayst me not some poisonous beast that with the sharpness of my edge sting, I might have staked them both into the earth while they were sporting in this darksome cave? And so, entering from the cave, Aeneas and Dido. The air is clear, and southern winds are whist. Come, Dido, let us hasten to the town, since gloomy Aeolus doth cease to frown. Achates and Ascanius, well met. Fair Anna, how escaped you from the shower? As others did, by running to the wood. But where were you, Iarbus, all this while? Not with Aeneas in the ugly cave. I see, Aeneas sticketh in your mind, but I will soon put by that stumbling balk and quell those hopes that thus employ your cares. 
exuant everyone and we move into scene two which has the charming uh, starting point um uh, could i ask somebody else to just briefly read stage directions here um anyone who's free uh, liza i see hand went up so if you could read stage directions for me scene two enter iarbus to sacrifice Come, servants, come, bring forth the sacrifice that I may pacify that gloomy Jove whose empty altars have enlarged our ills. Servants bring in the sacrifice and then exeunt. Eternal Jove, great master of the clouds, father of gladness and all frolic thoughts, that with thy gloomy hand corrects the heaven, when airy creatures war amongst themselves, hear, hear, O oh, hear, Iabus, plaining prayers, whose hideous echoes make the welkin howl, and all the woods, Eliza, to resound, the woman that thou wilt us entertain, where staying in our borders up and down, she craved a hide of ground to build a town with whom we did divide both laws and land and all the fruits that plenty else stands forth, scorning our loves and royal marriage rights, yields up her beauty to a stranger's bed, who having wrought her shame is straightway fled. Now, if thou beest a pitying God of power, on whom ruth and compassion ever waits, redress these wrongs and warn him to his ships, that now afflicts me with his flattering eyes. Enter Anna. How now, Ialbus, at your prayers so hard? Aye, uh, Anna, is there aught you would with me? Nay, no such weighty business of import, but may be slacked until another time. Yet, if you would partake with me the cause of this devotion that detained you, I would be thankful for such courtesy. Anna, against this Trojan, I do pray, who seeks to rob me of my sister's love and dive into her heart by coloured looks. Alas, poor king, that labours so in vain for her that so delighteth in thy pain. Be ruled by me, and seek some other love, whose yielding heart may yield thee more relief. My eye is fixed where fancy cannot start. Oh, oh, leave me, leave me to my silent thoughts that register the number, numbers of my root, and I will either move the thoughtless flint or drop out both mine eyes in drizzling tears before my sorrow's tide have any stint. I will not leave Iabus, whom I love, in this delight of dying pensiveness. Away with Dido! Anna be thy song! Anna! That doth admire thee more than heaven. I may nor will list to such loathsome change that intercepts the course of my desire. Servants, come, come fetch these empty he vessels here, for I will fly from these alluring eyes that do pursue my peace where e'er it goes. Exit Iarbus, servants re-enter and carry out the vessels, etc. Iarbus, stay, loving Iarbus. Stay, for I have honey to present thee with. Hard-hearted, wilt not deign to hear me speak? I'll follow thee without cries ne'ertheless, and strew thy walks of my dishevelled hair. Exit Anna. Exit Seems... Anna, thank you very much there. Um, yeah, oh, did we see that coming, ladies and gentlemen? Did we see that coming? Um, something for the actor to be putting in throughout the play. Scene three, enter Aeneas. Carthage, my friendly host, adieu. Since destiny doth call me from thy shore, Hermes, this night, descending in a dream, hath summoned me to fruitful Italy. Jove wills it so, my mother wills it so. Let my Fenissa grant, and then I go. Grant she or no, Aeneas must away whose golden fortunes clogged with courtly ease cannot ascend to fame's immortal house or banquet in bright honour's burnished hall till he hath furrowed Neptune's glassy fields and cut a passage through his topless hills. Achates, come forth. Segestus, Ilioneus, Cloanthus, haste away. Aeneas calls. Enter. What was our lord? Sorry. What was uh, enter Achates, Cloanthus, Sergius, and Eolonius. Sorry. Sorry. That's what right. Everyone entered. What did you call? <laughs> 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 okay, and go. 
What wills our Lord? And wherefore did he call? The dreams, brave maids, that did beset my bed, when sleep but newly had embraced the night, commands me leave these unrenowned realms, where as nobility abhors to stay, and none but base Aeneas will abide. Aboard, aboard, since fates do bid aboard, and slice the sea with sable-coloured ships, on whom the nimble winds may all day wait, and follow them as footmen through the deep. Yet Dido casts her eyes like anchors out, to stay my fleet from losing forth the bay. Come back, come back, I hear her cry afar, and let me link thy body to my lips, that tied together by the striving tongues we may as one sail into Italy. Banish that ticing dame from forth your mouth, follow your foreseeing stars in all. This is no life for men at arms to live, where dalliance doth consume a soldier's strength and wanton motions of alluring eyes effeminate our minds inured to war why let us build a city of our own and not stand lingering here for amorous looks will dido raise old priam forth his grave and build the town against the greeks did burn no no, she cares not how we sink or swim, so she may have Aeneas in her arms. To Italy, sweet friends, to Italy. We will not stay a minute longer here. Trojans aboard, and I will follow you. Exuant fain... all except Aeneas. I fain would go, yet beauty calls me back. To leave her so and not once say farewell were to transgress against all laws of love. But if I use such ceremonious thanks as parting friends of custom on the shore, her silver arms will call me round about and tears of pearl cry, Stay, Aeneas, stay. Each word she says will then contain a crown and every speech be ended with a kiss. I may not dure this female drudgery. To see, Aeneas, find out Italy. Exit, and as that scene closes, uh, the moment he uh, he got his end away, he immediately runs away. Um, that may be unfair. We shall have a discussion of that anon. Scene four. Enter Dido and Anna. Oh, Anna, run to the waterside. They say Aeneas' men are going aboard. It may be. He will steal away with them. Stay not to answer me. Run, Anna, run. And exit, Anna. Oh, foolish Trojans, I would steal from hence and not let Dido understand their drift. I would have given Achates store of gold and Ilionis gum and Libyan spice, the common soldiers' rich embroidered coats and silver whistles to control the winds which Circe sent Sicaeus when he lived. Unworthy are they of a queen's reward. See where they come, how might I do to chide? And re enter Anna with Aeneas, Achates, uh, Cloanthus, uh, Ilionius, uh, Sergius, and Carthaginian lords. T'was time to run. Aeneas had been gone. The sails were hoisting up, and he aboard. Is this thy love to me? O oh, princely Dido, give me leave to speak. I went to take my farewell of Achates. How hath Achates bidden me not farewell? Because I feared your grace would keep me here. To rid thee of that doubt, aboard again, I charge thee put to sea and stay not here. Then let Aeneas go aboard with us. Get you aboard, Aeneas means to stay. The sea is rough, the winds blow to the shore. Oh, false Aeneas, now the sea is rough, but when you were aboard, t'was calm enough. Thou and Achates meant to sail away. Hath not the Carthage queen mine only son? Thinks Dido I will go and leave him here? Aeneas. Pardon me, for I forgot that young Ascan As Ascanius lay with me this night. Love made me jealous, but to make amends, wear the imperial crown of Libya. Giving him her the crown and scepter. Sway thou the punic scepter in my stead, and punish me, Aeneas, for this crime. This kiss shall be fair Dido's punishment. Oh! How a crown becomes Aeneas' head. Stay here, Aeneas, and command as king. How vain am I to wear this diadem and bear this golden scepter in my hand. A burgeonet of steel and not a crown, a sword and not a scepter fits Aeneas. 
Oh, keep them still and let me gaze my fill. Now looks and he is like immortal Jove. Oh, where is Ganymede to hold his cup and Mercury to fly for what he calls 10,000 cupids hover in the air and fan it in Aeneas' lovely face? Oh, that the clouds were here wherein thou fledst, that thou and I unseen might sport ourselves. Heaven, envious of our joys, is waxen pale, and when we whisper, then the stars fall down to be partakers of our honey talk. Oh, Dido, patroness of all our lives, when I leave thee, death be my punishment. Swell, raging seas, frown, wayward destinies, blow, winds, threaten ye rocks and sandy shelves. This is the harbour that Aeneas seeks. Let's see what tempests can annoy me now. Not all the world can take thee from mine arms. Aeneas may command as many more as in the sea are little water drops. And now, to make experience of my love, fair sister Anna, lead my lover forth, and seated on my genet, let him ride as Dido's husband through the Punic streets, and will my guard with Mauritanian? Mauritanian? Mauritanian darts, to wait upon him as their sovereign lord. What did the citizens repine thereat? Those that dislike what Dido gives in charge command my guard to slay for their offence. Shall vulgar peasants storm at what I do? The ground is mine that gives them sustenance. The air within they breathe, the water, fire, all that they have, their lands, their goods, their lives. And I, the goddess of all these, command Aeneas rise, ride, as Carthaginian king. Aeneas, for his parentage, deserves as large a kingdom as is Libya. Aye, and unless the destinies be false, I shall be planted in as rich a land. Speak of no other land. This land is thine. Dido is thine. Henceforth, I'll the Lord. Do as I bid, do as I bid thee, sister. Lead the way, and from a turret I'll behold my love. Then here in me shall flourish Priam's race, and thou and I, Achates, for revenge, for Troy, for Priam, for his fifty sons, our kinsmen's lives and thousand guiltless souls, will lead an host against the hateful Greeks, and fire proud Lacedaemon o'er their heads. Exuant all except Dido and Carthaginian lords. Speaks not Aeneas like a conqueror. Oh, blessed tempests that did drive him in. Oh, happy sand that made him run aground. Henceforth, you shall be of our Carthage gods. Aye, but it may be he will leave my love and seek a foreign land called Italy. Oh, that I had a charm to keep the winds within the closure of a golden ball, or that the Tyrian sea were in mine arms that he might suffer shipwreck on my breast, as if he attempts to hoist up sail. I must prevent him, wishing will not serve. Go bid my nurse take young Ascanius and bear him in the country to her horse. Aeneas will not go without his son, yet, lest he should, for I am full of fear. Bring me his oars, his tackling, and his sails. Exit first, Lord. What if I sink his ships? Oh, he will frown. Better he frown than I should die for grief. I cannot see him frown, it may not be. Armies of foes resolved to win this town, or impious traitors vowed to have my life. Fright me not. Only Aeneas' frown is that which terrifies poor Dido's heart. Not bloody spears appearing in the air presage the downfall of my empery, nor blazing comets threaten Dido's death. It is Aeneas from that ends my days. If he forsake me not, I never die. For in his looks I see eternity, and he'll make me immortal with a kiss. Re-enter First Lord with attendants carrying tackling, etc. Your nurse is gone with young Ascanius, and here's Aeneas tackling oars and sails. Are these the sails that, in despite of me, packed with the winds to bear Aeneas hence? I'll hang ye in the chamber where I'll lie. Drive, if you can, my house to Italy. I'll set the casement open that the winds may enter in and once again conspire against the life of me, poor Carthage queen. But though you go, he stays in Carthage still and let rich Carthage fleet upon the seas. 
so I may have Aeneas in mine arms. Is this the wood that grew in Carthage plains and would be toiling in the watery billows to rob their mistress of her Trojan guest? O oh, cursed tree! Hadst thou but wit or sense to measure how I prize Aeneas' love, thou wouldst have leapt from out the sailor's hand, and told me that Aeneas meant to go. And yet I blame thee not, thou art but wood. The water, which our poets term a nymph, why did it suffer thee to touch her breast, and shrunk not back, knowing my love was there? The water is an element, no nymph. Why should I blame Aeneas for his flight? Oh, Dido, blame not him, but break his oars. These were the instruments that launched him forth. There's not so much as this base tackling to, but dares to heap up sorrow to my heart. Was it not you that hoised up these sails? Why burst you not, and they fell in the seas? For this, Dido, will Dido tie ye full of knots and shear ye asunder with her hands. Now serve ye to chast these ship boys for their faults. Ye shall no more offend the Carthage queen. Now let him hang my favors on his masts and see if those will serve instead of sails. For tackling, let him take the chains of gold which I bestowed upon his followers. Instead of oars, let him use his hands and swim to Italy. I'll keep thee sure. Come, bear them in. And end that scene at four. But of course, uh, Dido shouldn't worry. They have possession of uh, Aeneas' son, uh, don't they? Or do they? Scene five, enter nurse with Cupid as Ascanius. My lord Ascanius, you must go with me. Whither must I go? I'll stay with my mother. No, thou shalt go with me unto my house. I have an orchard that hath store of plums, brown apricots, services, ripe figs and dates, dewberries, apples, yellow oranges, a garden where are beehives full of honey, musk roses, and a thousand sort of flowers. And in the midst doth run a silver stream, where thou shalt see the red gilled fishes leap white swans and many lovely waterfowls. Now speak, Ascanius, will you go or no? Oh, come, come, I'll go. How far hence is your house? But hereby, child, we shall get thither straight. Nurse, I am weary. Will you carry me? Aye, so you'll dwell with me and call me mother. So you'll love me. I care not if I do. <laughs> that I might live to see this boy a man. How prettily he laughs. Go, you wag, you'll be a twigger when you come to age. Say Dido what she will. I am not old. I'll be no more a widow. I am young. I'll have a husband, or else a lover. A husband, and no teeth. Oh, what mean I to have such foolish thoughts? Foolish is love, a, a toy. Oh, sacred love! If there be any heaven in earth, tis love, especially in women of... Is that your line, Cupid? Um, uh, oh, maybe, yeah. Uh, especially in women of your years. <sighs> blush. Blush for shame. Why shouldst thou think of love? A grave and not a lover fits thy age. A grave? Why, I may live a hundred years. Four score is but a girl's age. Love is sweet. My veins are withered and my sinews dry. Why do I think of love now I should die? Come, nurse. Well, if he come a-wooing, he shall speed. Oh, how unwise was I to say him nay. And that closes the act. That's an interesting question. I, the, the, in uh, the editions that I've got in front of me, um, that is all nurse, the nurse's single speech. Um, um, I, I, I think talking about yourself in the third person. Um, but I, I like that as an idea that he's yeah. um, throwing things in. Yeah, I mean, it was just that one line, especially in women of your years, it seemed to sort of link up nicely with a husband and no teeth. Mm. Um, because for the nurse to refer to herself as you in one line and as thou in the next line seemed a yeah. little bit mal apropos. 
but, I, but no, I, would... no, I like that. I think that's a, that's a good call. Uh, I think in performance, we're definitely, you know, I'm not going to claim any authority on the text, uh, but I think that that's a really, um, but um, yeah, that's that's an interesting thought. Like so that. we so we've got again that lovely thing of multiple shots by Cupid and the sort of back and forth yeah. of the subject. Yeah, so just going, oh, ah, ee, ah, yes, it's, uh, and you did that very nicely. Um, so again, I, I, again, we've got a very clear line on Dido, but Aeneas is still, um, I mean, it's like, I mean, we don't know what they did in the cave, obviously. We don't know for certain. <laughs> But it does seem very much like um, he, uh, he, uh, 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 that you... Uh, uh, that the troth was plighted. And then you just immediately go, right, I'm off. <laughs> as quickly as you can. Pretty much. Well, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, go on, go on. No, I mean, I thought, I kind of thought they had like, the, it's sort of like they're in, like a, like a little impromptu and not, not proper or improperly done like little marriage with the exchanging of uh of valuables mm. um uh with, with the wedding i mean of course one could easily say the wedding ring but like you know the giving up the jewels and and sort of squaring uh sort of a declaration of love if you will um but is it possible to see it as a marriage i guess i i i direct this question to the crowd well, I, I think in, in, in terms of, you know, people at the time, if, they, if they've, they've gone in a cave and had it off, then, then um, <laughs> there's, there's sort of an agreement has been started here. <laughs> well, it, it, um, they, they swore their love to each other and she gave him a ring. I don't know if he then gives, gives her one, <laughs> but we see this in, in a lot of... <laughs> Sorry. Maybe that was maybe that was poorly worded on my part. It, we see this a lot in plays I, of. I, of I this. don't know at the national, but they definitely did on tour. Um, uh, sorry. Um, we see this in plays of it, at this period. You didn't necessarily need a priest to marry you if you were of high class or high status, a king or a queen. Obviously, it helps. But we're not talking. Of, none of these characters are Christian. So if you swear your love to each other and, and exchange rings, basically you're, you're married. Mm. Um, and there's an interesting point also that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's this question of um, <laughs> status of how good is Carthage as a, as a potential uh, landing ground in that sense. You know, it's, is, is it a bit small for, uh, for in Aeneas's mind uh, for what he potentially could get as well? Is, some, uh, is there a slightly cynical calculation? Certainly in his discussion with, um, with uh, 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 Achates, I think. Um, yes, and also that it's sort of not good enough that he, that he sort of gets it at second hand, that he's got to go and kind of win it himself in Italy because mm. that's what's been that's predestinate that, that in one way I guess he is as much a, a pawn of Venus and Co as is as Dido is that there's there's all this talk by the gods that he's going to go to Italy um, and therefore that's what has to happen like you know if we if we are um, if he is nodding back to Greek tragedy um, that, that you've got to do it it's your it's your fate and it was interesting that you said earlier that he's sort of suffering from PTSD because it sort of seems like some of it he's almost like sleepwalking mm. through it like like Dido is very much the one who is, is vacillating between very strong viewpoints and he's sort of he's just he, there he doesn't <laughs> have an inner life in no. the way that Dido does Dido has a no. very clear inner 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 life and mm. I don't I don't see anything coming from Aeneas except surface no, in fact, the, the most sort of the most sort of impassioned and invested he feels is that sort of torture porn speech that he gives about um, about the, the the rapine and pillage in in Troy. It seems like it's sort of his that so far seems sort of his emotional high point um, in the play, where he's genuinely engaged with what he's with what he's saying. Um, and compared to, the, the, to that, the rest of it with Dido is sort of a bit of cold fish, really. That fits well, though. Um... Hello. Yeah, go, go Sarah. <laughs> um, that fits though psychologically um, mm. with with the PTSD though, because um, like when you um, hear veterans, like uh, you know, war veterans talk about their 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 
their PTSD, they'll quite often speak with great um, clarity and engagement and almost excitement about um, what they've been through and what happened to them. Um, and then the rest of the time they are literally like zombies. Hmm. You know, they're not really feeling, they're not, they're, they're dissociating, they're not uh, allowing themselves to have feelings. So just, I mean, given that that's kind of a modern view of PTSD um, and that, you know, Marlo and Nash were, were writing this, you know, it, it does hold up actually psychologically. It really does hold up to, hmm. to what we, what our modern understanding is of trauma. So the fact that the rest of the time he's wandering around a bit bemused <laughs> and, and just kind of very surface and just going, Oh yeah, yeah. I'll do whatever you want to do. Yeah. I'll just, yeah, yeah. I'm in love with you. Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. We'll just do this now. Yeah. Um, can, it does, can I have my boats now? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it, it does. It does actually all fit psychologically, which is really extraordinary. Um, I think it's just, uh, yeah. Eloise, were you going to say something? I was, I was literally going to try and articulate what was just articulated very well. Um, I was just going to say, I think it might just be Marlowe being actually really, and Nash being really, brilliant and ahead of their time and very astute about um um about ways that humans process and cope with traumatic experiences and cupid is that, key to this I also think. yes Stephen. so i was going to say cupid is key to this really because um i mean troy is one of the the big big things you know in um somebody's poem the rape of lucrece there's this huge sort of three or four hundred line description of somebody looking at a tapestry of the fall of troy it's nothing to do with the story at all uh, he's got to have ptsd but there is there is no reason for dido to fall for this guy because he's so freaked so we need cupid to actually make it happen if you but you've you've got to take the ptsd seriously because troy mm. You couldn't get away with him having kind of recovered from that. Yeah. It's and interesting. So this, this, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say the, the frame is actually hugely important because the psychology, it uh, doesn't work as a love story otherwise. Mm. It is interesting. Dido doesn't actually see the bit when he's freaking out um, as well. I think she comes in just after that completes. Yeah. So there may be an element of she's only seeing certain certain things. I, I, this is very interesting, but I think we really do need to plough to the end. We were talking of trauma. Let's let's go for it. Um, let's go for the trauma because uh, this doesn't end well um, if you haven't already twigged. Um, <laughs> yeah. Act five, and uh, we enter. Aeneas with a paper in his hand, drawing the platform of the city. Achates, uh, Sir Gestus, Cloanthus, and Ilionius. Triumph, my mates. Our travels are at an end. Here will Aeneas build a statelier Troy than that which grim Atreides overthrew. Carthage shall vaunt her petty walls no more. For I will grace them with a fairer frame, and clad her in a crystal livery, wherein the day may evermore delight. From golden India Ganges will I fetch, whose wealthy streams may wait upon her towers, and triple-wise entrench her round about. The sun from Egypt shall rich odours bring, wherewith his burning beams, like labouring bees that load their thighs with hiveless honey spoils, shall here unburden their exhaled sweets, and plant our pleasant suburbs with their fumes. What length or breadth shall this brave town contain? Not past 4,000 paces at the most. Uh, uh, Ilionius? I'm sorry, yep, yeah, I know. I've, um, I'm having a, 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 a glitch. I apologise. That what is fine. I'll just, I'll just pause you there for a second, because it just occurs to me that I haven't queued up a Hermes. Um... Uh, who is free? Um, and I, think I think this is my last line coming up. So I okay, can be so if you can be Hermes when when Hermes enters, excellent. So um, uh, Ilionius. But what shall it be called? Troy is before. That have I not determined with myself. Let it be termed Inea by your name. Father Ascania by your little son. Nay, I will have it called Anchision of my old father's name. Enter Hermes with Ascanius. Aeneas, stay. Jove's herald bids thee stay. Whom do I see? 
Joe's winged messenger, welcome to Carthage, new erected town. Hermes. That's Hermes from the Sorry. speech prefix, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, why couldn't stand you building cities here and beautifying the empire of this queen while Italy is clean out of thy mind? Too, too forgetful of thine own affairs. Why wilt thou so betray thy son's good hap? The king of God sent me from highest heaven to sound this angry message in thine ears. Vain man, what monarchy expects thou here? Or with what thought sleeps thou in Libya, sure? All that glory hath forsaken thee, and thou despise the praise of such attempts, yet think upon Ascanius's prophecy, and young Eulus, more than thousand years, whom I have brought from Ida, where he slept, and bore young Cupid unto Cyprus Isle. This was my mother that beguiled the queen, and made me take my brother for my son. No marvel, Dido, though thou be in love, that daily danglest Cupid in thy arms. Welcome, sweet child. Where hast thou been this long? Eating sweet comfits with Queen Dido's maid, who ever since hath lulled me in her arms. Segestus, bear him hence unto our ships, lest Dido, spying him, keep him for a pledge. Exit Segestus with Ascanius. Spend thou thy time about this little boy, and gives not ear unto the charge I bring. I tell thee, thou must straight to Italy, or else abide the wrath of frowning Jove. Exit Hermes. How should I put into the raging deep, who have no sails nor tackling for my ships? What, would the gods have me, Deucalion-like, float up and down where the billows drive? Though she repaired my fleet and gave me ships, yet hath she taken away my oars and masts, and left me neither sail nor stern aboard? And here enters Iabus, um, um, the person you're most looking forward to meeting <laughs> again. How now, Aeneas, sad? What mean these dumps? Iabus, I am clean besides myself. Jove hath heaped on me such a desperate charge, which neither art nor reason may achieve, nor I devise by what means to contrive. As how, I pray, may I entreat you tell? With speed he bids me sail to Italy, whenas I want both rigging for my fleet and also furniture for these my men. If that be all, then cheer thy drooping looks, for I will furnish thee with such supplies. Let some of those thy followers go with me, and they shall have what things o'er they need. Thanks, good Yarbus, for thy friendly aid. <laughs> Achates and the rest shall wait on thee, whilst I rest thankful for this courtesy. Exuant all except Aeneas. Now will I haste unto Lavinian shore, and raise a new foundation to old Troy. Witness the gods, and witness heaven and earth, how loath I am to leave these Libyan bounds, but that eternal Jupiter commands. Enter Dido. Fear I saw Aeneas' little son led by Achates to the Trojan fleet. If it be so, his father means to fly. But here he is. Now, Dido, try thy wit. Aeneas, wherefore go thy men abro abroad? W why are thy ships new rigged? Or to what end launched from the haven? Lie they in the road? Pardon me, though I ask. Love makes me ask. Oh, pardon me if I resolve thee why. Aeneas will not feign with his dear love. I must from hence. This day, swift Mercury, when I was laying a platform for these walls, sent from his father Jove, appeared to me, and in his name rebuked me bitterly for lingering here, neglecting Italy. But yet Aeneas will not leave his love. I am commanded by immortal Jove to leave this town and pass to Italy, and therefore must of force. These words proceed not from Aeneas' heart. Not from my heart, for I can hardly go, and yet I may not stay. Dido, farewell. Farewell? Is this the men's for Dido's love? Do Trojans use to quit their lovers thus? <sighs> farewell, may Dido, so Aeneas stay. I die if my Aeneas say farewell. Then let me go and never say farewell. Let me go. Farewell. I must from hence. These words are poison to poor Dido's soul. Oh, speak like my Aeneas, like my love. Why looks thou toward the sea? The time hath been when Dido's beauty chained thine eyes to her. Am I thus fair that when thou sawst me first? Oh, 
than Aeneas tis for grief of thee. Say thou wilt say in Carthage with thy queen, and Dido's beauty will return again. Aeneas, say, how canst thou take thy leave? Wilt thou kiss Dido? Oh, thy lips have sworn to stay with Dido. Canst thou take her hand? Thy hand and mine have plighted mutual faith. Therefore, unkind Aeneas, must thou say, then let me go and never say farewell? O oh, Queen of Carthage, wert thou ugly black, Aeneas could not choose but hold thee dear. Yet must he not gainsay the gods' behest? The gods? What gods be those that seek my death? Wherein have I offended Jupiter, that he should take Aeneas from my arms? Oh, no, the gods weigh not what lovers do. It is Aeneas calls Aeneas hence, and woeful Dido by these blubbered cheeks, by this right hand, and by our spousal rights, desires Aeneas to remain with her. Si bene quid te, te, te morir, Quid aut tibi quid quam dulce mio miserere domus labines, es istol mo oro, qui quis aduc presibus locus ex exumentem. Desine meque tuis incendere teque querelis, Italiam non sponte sequo. Hast thou forgot how many neighbor kings were up in arms for making thee my love? How Carthage did rebel, Iarbis storm, and for all the world calls me a second Helen, for being entangled by a stranger's looks. So wouldst thou, so would, so thou wouldst prove as true as Paris did, would as fair Troy was, Carthage might be stacked, and I be called a second Helena. Had I a son by thee, the grief were less that I might see Aeneas in his face. Now if thou goest, what canst thou leave behind, but rather will augment than ease my woe? In vain, my love, thou spends thy fainting breath. If words might move me, I were overcome. And wilt thou not be moved with Dido's words? Thy mother was no goddess perjured man, nor Dardanus the author of thy stock. But thou art sprung from Scythian Caucasus, and tigers of Hyrcantia gave thee suck. A oh, foolish Dido, to forbear this long. Wast thou not wrecked upon this Libyan shore, and camest to Dido like a fisher swain? Repaired not I thy ships, made thee a king, and all thy needy followers noblemen? O oh, serpent, that came creeping from the shore, and I for pity harbored in my bosom. Wilt thou now slay me with thy venomed sting and hiss at Dido for preserving thee? Go, go and spare not, seek out Italy. I hope that which love forbids me do, the rocks and sea gulfs will perform at large, and thou shalt perish at the billows' ways, to whom poor Dido doth bequeath revenge. I, traitor, and the waves shall cast thee up where thou and false Achates first set foot, which if it chance, I'll give ye burial and weep upon your lifeless carcasses, though thou and he will pity me a whit. Why starest thou in my face? If thou wilt stay, leap in mine arms, my own arms are wide open. If not, turn from me, and I'll turn from thee. For thou hast the heart to say farewell, I have not power to stay here. Exit Aeneas. Is he gone? Ay, but he'll come again. He cannot go. He loves me too, too well to serve me so. Yet he that in my sight would not relent, will being absent be obdurate still. By this is he got to the waterside, and see... The sailor's taken by the hand, but he shrinks back, and now, remembering me, returns amain. <laughs> welcome, welcome, my love. But where's Aeneas? Oh, he's gone. He's gone. Enter Anna. What means my sister thus to rave and cry? Oh, Anna, my Aeneas is abroad, and leaving me will sail to Italy. Once didst thou go, and he came back again. Now bring him back, and thou shalt be a queen, and I will live a private life with him. 
Wicked Aeneas! Call him not wicked, sister. Speak him fair, and look upon him with a mermaid's eye. Tell him I never vowed at Ollie's Gulf the desolation of his native Troy, nor sent a thousand ships unto the walls, nor ever violated faith to him. Request him gently, Anna, to return. I crave but this, he stay a tide or two, that I may learn to bear it patiently. If he depart thus suddenly, I die. Run, Anna, run, stay not to answer me. I go, fair sister, heavens grant good success. Exit Anna, enter nurse. Oh, Dido, your little son Ascanius is gone. He lay with me last night, and in the morning... He was stolen from me. I think some fairies have beguiled me. Oh, cursed hag and false dissembling wretch that slays me with thy harsh and hellish tale. Thou for some petty gift hast let him go, and I am thus deluded of my boy. Away with her to prison presently. Enter attendants. Traitress to kenned and cursed sorceress. I know not what you mean by treason, I. I am as true as any one of yours. Away with her. Suffer her not to speak. Exit nurse with attendance. Ah. My, sis <laughs> My sister comes. I like not her sad looks. Re-enter Anna. Before I came, Aeneas was aboard, and spying me, hoist up the sails amain. But I cried out, Aeneas! False Aeneas, stay! Then gun he wag his hand, which yet held up. Make me suppose he would have heard me speak. Then gan they drive into the ocean, with which when I viewed, I cried, Aeneas, stay! Dido, fair Dido, wills Aeneas stay? Yet he, whose hearts of adamant or flint, my tears nor plaints could mollify a wit. Then carelessly I rent my hair for grief which seemed to all, though he beheld me not, they gan to move him to redress my roof, and stay a while to hear what I could say, but he, clapped under hatches, sailed away. Oh, Anna, Anna, I will follow him. How can you go when he hath all your fleet? I'll frame me wings of wax, like Icarus, and o'er his ships will soar unto the sun, that they may melt, and I fall into his arms. Or else I'll make a prayer unto the waves that I may swim to him like Triton's niece. Oh, Anna, Anna, friend, fetch Arian's harp that I may tice a dolphin to the shore and ride upon his back unto my love. Look, sister, look, lovely Aeneas ships. See, see, the billows heave him up to heaven. And now down falls the keels into the deep. Oh, sister, sister, take away the rocks. They'll break his ships. Oh, Proteus, Neptune, Jove, save, save Aeneas. Dido's life, Leafus love. Now is he come on shore, safe without hurt. But see, Achates wills him put to sea, and all the sailors merry make for joy. But he, remembering me, shrinks back again. See where he comes? Welcome. Welcome, my love. Oh, sister, leave these idle fantasies. Sweet sister, cease. Remember who you are. Dido I am, unless I be deceived. And must I rave thus for a renegade? Must I make ships for him to sail away? Nothing can bear me to him but a ship, and he hath all my fleet. What shall I do but die in fury of this oversight? I, I must be the murderer of myself. No, but I am not, yet I will be straight. Anna, be glad, now I have found a mean to rid me of these thoughts of lunacy. Not far from hence, there is a woman famous, said for arts, daughter unto the nymphs Hesperides, who, will who willed me sacrifice his ticing relics. Go, Anna, bid my servants bring me fire. Enter Iarbus. How Exit long Anna. will Dido mourn a stranger's flight that have dishonoured her and Carthage both? How long shall I with grief consume my days and reap no guerdon for my truest love? Enter attendants with wood and torches. Iarbus, 
talk not of Aeneas, let him go. Lay to thy hands and help me make a fire that shall consume all that this stranger left. For I intend a private sacrifice to cure my mind that melts for unkind love. But afterwards will Dido grant me love? Aye. Aye, Yarbus. After all this is done, none in the world shall have my love but thou. They make a fire. So leave me now. Let none approach this place. Exeunt Yarbus and attendants. Now, Dido, with these relics burn thyself, and make Aeneas famous through the world for perjury and slaughter of a queen. Here lie the sword that in the darksome cave he drew, and swore by it to be true to me. Thou shalt burn first, the crime is worse than his. Here lie the garment which I clothed him in, when first he came on shore. Perish thou too. These letters, lines, and perjured papers all shall burn to cinders in this precious flame. And now, ye gods, that guide the starry frame, and order all things at your high dispose, grant, though the traitors land in Italy, they may be still tormented with unrest. And from mine ashes let a conqueror rise that may revenge this treason to a queen by ploughing up his countries with the sword. Betwixt this land and that be never leak. Litora litibus contrara fructibus undas imprecor arma armis pugent ipsice nepotes. Live, false Aeneas. Truest Dido dies. Sic, sic uvat ire um sub umbras. Throws herself into the flames. Re enter Anna. <gasps> oh, help me, Arbus! Dido in these flames hath burnt herself. Ay, ay, unhappy me. Re enter Iarbus, running. First, Iarbus, die to expiate the grief that tires upon thine inward soul. Dido, I come to thee. I, me, Aeneas. Stabs himself and dies. <laughs> what can my tears or cries prevail me now Dido is dead? Iarbus slain. Iarbus, my dear love. Oh, sweet Iarbus. And a soul delight. What fatal destiny envies me thus to see my sweet Iarbus slay himself? But now Anna shall honour thee in death and mix her blood with thine. This shall I do, that gods and men may pity this my death and rue our ends, senses of life or breath. Now, sweet Iarbus, stay. I come to thee. Stabs oh. herself and dies. <laughs> and thus ends this happy, happy play. Um, uh -huh. um, it's interesting I, in, in a sense that when I kill myself, it's not like anyone in the audience cares, but it's, it's, it's so that Anna, Anna, Anna has a double reason to kill herself, um, I suppose. Um, uh, so much there. I, there's so much there where it's like this lovely radio play where they're describing, look over there, I can see the thing happening over there. It's really, really nicely done. Um, mm. And also what's happening as, a, as Aeneas is watching Dido get more and more um, you know, angry with him. And, you know, why starest thou in my face? Well, I think because, yeah, I'm definitely off now. Um, I wonder there, you know, and when does he yeah, exit precisely in terms of her not noticing that he's gone or, or, or asking if he's gone and, and how that is expected to to be performed. Thoughts from the room? Everyone's it's stunned. A strange, strange place where the, um, the play ends, actually. It's sort of, it, it feels like it's, uh, it's a bit different from things we've been reading before. It's a very sort of formulaic with a, with a long speech at the end, kind of the, uh, the sort of epilogue kind of speech. It's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot more drama. And having someone kill themselves at the end of the play. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's no guarantee there wasn't an epilogue that just hasn't survived or uh, for performances, but it does seem like that this is this is the the meat of 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 the piece. Um, a, a, anyone else in uh, thoughts thoughts from the room? I wonder if it, talking about where Aeneas uh, leaves, where it's marked there. Um, mm. I wonder if she almost does something like literally she says, "I'll I'll turn from thee," but she literally turns her back and kind of goes, "I'm going to turn my back and see if he's gone." If, if yeah. he's gone. Is he gone? And he slopes off, which is remarkable. Like there is not even a passing shot or a passing word. And it's it's interesting because the only time he actually seems to come alive is when he's prompted by Mercury to remember Italy and go and do that thing that you're supposed to do. Mm. Um, and he, I mean, he does come across as quite pasteboard that that people project things onto him and they're probably able to because he's he's kind of empty to a degree. He's kind of able to have this stuff projected on him but you know to fight i feel i have to fight his corner having just sat here for the last how many hours and read him um, <laughs> that he is to me he is as much a victim of circumstance as dido uh, okay uh, you know there's been this slow burn plot with cupid kind of uh, and, and venus standing behind it and juno to a degree to sort of ensnare dido but he's at the behest of 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 mercury of uh, hermes and, and jupiter if he doesn't go and found italy but, but, presumably rack and ruin is going to follow anyway so uh, we, we've yeah. we've come we've come full circle as Stephen was saying with you know we, we've uh, you know with the gods in involvement they keep a different god pops in every 15 minutes or so and just nudges the action along somewhere in one some way shape or form um, did anybody see the the rsc production of it a few years back no. No. Uh, that, that basically the gods were these sort of trust fund wasters who were filming the whole thing on their phones <laughs> and just sort of you know you know they're on a different different scale to humans it's all just footage to them mm. mm -hmm. no. that they're, oh. they're just gonna you know sort of gif it or tweet it a little bit later you know they're completely <laughs> indifferent really uh, to human address, beings yeah i just want to address uh couple of elephants in the room in the sense of the two women um they it's clear that in um, in this play they um they actually are falling into the role of the victim in a way you know how um, there's a lot of mindsets that are going around um as a whole um in fact there's two being displayed here uh, the bad boy syndrome and there's also that aspect of wanting to heal somebody who's broken and it seems like those two women in their own way have actually fallen into that trap the, i mean dido wants to save her lover you know she can see he's traumatized but she in her own way wants to save him she's i mean look she gives him as well to um punish in quote her for her words her crown and her possessions that in a way is actually giving up power to the broken. And then of course, you've got the other coin. You've got um, Anna, who's very much in love with the, with the bad boy of the crowd, who's clearly not gonna love her, but yet she still runs after him. There is uh, a de there's a determination with this love as well. It's, it, 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 there, there is no compromise here. You know, the, these people will, be, will, will, will carry on regardless and, and, and nothing, Nothing goes. Any any uh, responses to that uh, from the room? Any 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 thoughts a, on that? A couple, yeah. Um, firstly, um, a lot of Dido's agency is taken away by the presence of the gods. Um, she, you know, would she have fallen in love with in within the world of this play? Would she have fallen in love with Aeneas if Cupid hadn't, as it were, given her a roofie? Um, and. Uh, you know, Anna at least is in love. You know, honestly, the uh, uh, basically the woman in this play with agency is Venus. Mm -hmm. mm. She's the maker and the mover. How does Dido feel about that? Well, uh, Venus isn't her god. Mm. <laughs> Emily, sorry, I talked over you. No, please, please. I don't want to. I I would love to hear your thoughts. Well. I do love the way that Dido, the, I, I do love how Dido loves. I love her. Um, 
her last words to Aeneas, just they're so honest and so simple and so exposed. The, if thou wilt stay, leap in mine arms. Mine arms are open wide. If not, turn from me and I'll turn from thee. For though thou hast the heart to, stay, to say farewell, I have no power to stay thee. That's, you know, could be anyone talking to any lover in any time. Mm -hmm. it, it very much feels like it just, it, it's so, it's still so relevant. It feels like when you talk into any relationship, like, look, you have your own capabilities. I'm not going to force this on you, but I love you and I want you to stay. And there's like in that moment, this, 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 this queen who, uh, you know, is considers herself high above her, uh, her class. And, uh, she's just, she, she turns into something that we all are. And just, she's just so vulnerable in that moment. I, I agree. It is, I'm like, Marlo, great writing. That's perfect. Good job, Marlo. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And, and, also and, and just Nash, and Nash. And Nash, sorry. Well, never Nash. forget Nash. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna contest <laughs> Nash. I'm gonna contest him because this script, it, it reads like Juvenilia, it, but it, it reads like someone who's more of a poet than a playwright, which Marlowe always was. But it yes. is so Marlovian, and there are so many intertexts with other Marlowe plays um, yes. that I have a very hard time seeing any hand but his in this. It's, it's juvenilia, to be sure. It's not the work of the mature playwright. Um, it's, a, it's, a college kid's, it's a college kid's bit of fun, but it's a really good bit of fun. Well, the, uh, the dating for this, uh, the, if, if we're going with uh, w uh, Wiggins' um, uh, uh, chronology, then it's much later than you think it is. Um, oh, yeah? It's not as early uh, as that. Uh, so yeah. it's around about the time of Tamblaine and, and, and others. Oh. So it's... Um, I, uh, the, 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 these things are shifting, but I've, I've got in front of me um, the, the, the le learned opinion of the letter certainly with Thomas. There's a certainly put in there. So uh, someone is very, very, very convinced. Um, I, I, I don't like to go into this too much, but um, I, 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 I think this, the name Nash has been associated with this play for quite a long time. I don't think this is a new opinion. Stephen, uh, weigh in here, please. <laughs> uh, wasn't it on the title page? There's some yeah. kind of really early attribution to Nash. Mm. I think that's where that came from. Mm. Um, um, and um, yeah, so I, 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 it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I think we can be relatively confident on that one. Um, <coughs> It doesn't mean he wrote it at all. No, it's just no it doesn't. It's on the title yeah. page. <laughs> but, um, but, no strange uh, errors in those documents. Yeah. Marlowe probably owed him money. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was dead by then, wasn't he? It, it came out, uh, did it come out just after he died, I think. Uh, it came out in 94. Yeah, it was printed in 94. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Marlowe's killed in 93. Mm. That's right. Maybe Nash could have like re edited it. Wait, was Nash alive then? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Nash died yeah. in. 1600 or so i think okay so, so we can yeah. get bogged down on this but i i, I, I think we we've, we've got to, i just like to get away from the possibility uh, that you know it's one singular playwright who is the genius rather than the more collaborative uh, uh side of things um and well, there's, a, there's another collaborator which is which is virgil mm, yes B mm. because yeah, the... any any educated member of the audience you know, that's what all that Latin's doing there. I'm, I'm, yeah, I it's expect, so meta. I expect that's Virgil. Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah. It is. It's, it's, People it's, expect to hear long chunks of stuff. They're, 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 they're literally quoting a book about themselves. I mean, it's, it, 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 <laughs> it, it, it's, it's so meta. It's, it's wonderful. Um, I, I, I love that. Um, could I just uh, go to the, some of the peripheral characters in the room and the peripheral uh, 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 people? Um, how do we feel about the, the other characters, the sort of the, the, the soldiers and the, the, the hangers on and the, the people around that? So I was going to say, uh, Eloise, um, you know, from your, your position, how did you find the play? Um, and Joseph as well, and, uh, and uh, uh, Hayden McCabe as well. Uh, any thoughts from, from that end of the room? Well, being Jupiter, obviously one is in charge. 
<laughs> I wasn't asking who had for a few newer Jupiter, <laughs> but for other other characters. Um, but it's interesting. Jupiter is sort of at a distance in charge. He just sort of sets everything else and, and buggers off. Um, well, literally. Yes, <laughs> literally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, does, no, just he does uh, decide to look after Aeneas, doesn't he? Yeah, after requested. Um, but I was thinking more the the other characters within the 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 the, the orbit of this this main love story. Um, any it's thoughts? Cool to see what um, the sort of motivation of Sergestes. I think I, I quite like the uh, the moment where he's like, "Oh, look, his his um, this, this queen called Dido. She's going to be really nice to you." <laughs> and that's. Yeah, it's kind of the, the function of Sergestus, I think, at that point. Um, yeah, Cupid's Cupid's kind of fun. Uh, it's, it does sort of slightly jar that he's such a kind of light and silly character in a way. Um, I do, I, it, like, I think what you were saying about the RC production with the gods on their, their phones, that really kind of comes through, actually, a bit. Certainly with that, that, uh, introductory scene. It's mm. it's strange to think of the introductory scene and the ending scene because you sort of all of the all of the gods and all the supernatural kind of element to it sort of falls away towards the end. I feel. Mm. Mm. Eloise, uh, any thoughts? Um, I think I'm. Um, I've been thinking thinking a lot about the after. Talking about um, remarking on how kind of distance and distant and disconnected Aeneas seems, um, I was kind of listening to it all from that kind of perception and from that reading of it. Um, and I guess it's interesting to think how are the other character, how are the other uh, young men who have also returned from war, how have they all been? impacted but um certainly um oh, I can't even say it anymore Ilionius um I don't know doesn't seem to be showing doesn't seem to be carrying the same weight maybe mm. um, um uh, yeah. uh yeah I don't honestly I have a huge amount of thoughts. It's not that it's quite hard to have a huge amount of thoughts about Ilionius, I think. <laughs> um, serves serves a function um, and, and and has some good dialogue, uh, but um, not there is only so much one one can say, perhaps. Yeah. Um, last thoughts because it is very late and um i feel the room of requirement is calling me very very urgently so um <laughs> uh any any last uh, thoughts at this stage i wonder if there's something to be said in terms of looking at the character that actually aeneas is kind of half divine isn't he because he's mm. if he's venus's son that he doesn't feel things like an ordinary Mortal. I mean, that might be getting a bit too psychological for this, but I want talking about the other young men and their experiences of, of things that that might, that if he is half of one of these hooray is filming stuff on his movie, that he, on his phone, that he's, he's half and half, he's got one foot in both camps, which maybe makes him a bit unhuman. I, that's a really nice thought. I like that. Mm -hmm. that. That creates a nice through line. Um, anyone else? I just really enjoyed reading this play. I adore mm. Marlowe and Nash's writing. Like it's just <laughs> so beautiful and it flows off the page and you just you're you're cast in the play like immediately into the world. And it's just I love the imagery in this play. It's just gorgeous. Mm. Mm. The characters are just so vibrant here in Marlowe's plays. Um, but this was a perfect example of actually fusing myth with reality. Um paying such a beautiful tribute to Greek mythology as well. Um, really enjoyable to do. Thank you. Right. Well, I, I, I think that that calls us to the end of uh, Dido. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and we can put the marshmallows away from, from the burning fire um, there and, uh, and have a nibble on them now. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, Beyond Shakespeare Exploring session. 
and um, it's good to get something a little longer under our belt to see precisely how much toll it takes on us physically. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and we'll go into housekeeping now. Goodbye. <laughs>